everyone on social media right now is glorifying the stretch. It's all the rage at the moment, and that is stretch-mediated hypertrophy. Very strong evidence in favor of lengthened training over shortened training. So the bicep is pretty short here. Yeah. Whereas... You can do them with a super deep stretch. But no one's talking about the major downsides that come with spamming stretch bias movements. Not every muscle or exercise actually benefits from stretch. No one is considering muscle activation levels and leverages of a muscle in a given movement pattern. This is due to the principles of neuromechanical matching, the length tension relationship and internal moment arms of a given muscle. Essentially, if a muscle doesn't have great leverage to produce force in a given position, which in this case would be the stretch position, as other muscle groups are taking over the movement, your target muscle will not experience any mechanical tension and or motor unit recruitment, which means that you will not grow your target muscle effectively, even though you're focusing on the optimal stretch biased exercises everyone is preaching about. What we want out of an exercise is very simple. We want to choose an exercise where the target muscle has the most leverage to produce force, which therefore maximizes muscle activation levels. It doesn't matter whether that's a stretch bias movement, shorter bias movement, as long as your target muscle is the muscle that goes to failure, that has the most mechanical tension and motor unit recruitment, it is the best exercise for that target muscle. We all know that one guy on YouTube Fitness who's preaching about the dumbbell pullover being one of the best exercises for the lats, just because it biases the stretch. The dumbbell pullover is essentially a length and partial for your lats. On average, it's going to train your lats at longer muscle lengths in a more stretched position compared to the cable pullover. But as I said, neuromechanical matching, the length tension relationship and internal moment arms are far more important than what strength profile an exercise has. What he's not considering is if you move your arms above 120 degrees, your lats lose leverage. Your pecs, the long end of the triceps, and your teres major gain leverage while the lats lose leverage. And I can confirm this from my anecdotal experience. Every time I did dumbbell pullovers, it felt absolutely fucking great for my pecs and my long end of the triceps, but I felt absolutely zero activation in my lats. Now let's look at what joint angles and strength profiles the lats actually have more leverage to produce force and higher activation levels. Shoulder extension exercises involving peak forces at 30 to 60 degrees will be optimal and will target the thoracic region of the lats. This would be something like a lat bias pull down or lat bias row that has peak forces or max tension in the shortened position, while exercises that involve peak forces above 120 degrees will target the pelvic region. The lats are activated on the dumbbell pullover to an extent, but again, the other muscle groups are definitely taking over the movement and are taking away from the stimulus of the lats as they are not the limiting factor if you go to failure. If another muscle group fails far before your actual target muscle, it is no winner. Shoulder adduction exercises that involve peak forces between 65 and 75 degrees will be optimal and will target the lumbar and pelvic regions. This would be an vertical pull in front of plane, which you would need a wider grip for. For example, a wide grip pull-up, a right grip pull-down, any of those type of movements. Now let's look at an example where the stretch is definitely the better option to choose for your program. For this, we'll have to look at the biceps, the brachialis, and the brachioradialis. So the biceps has the best leverage if your hand is supinated and the peak forces are at the lengthened position. The brachialis has the best leverage if your hand is pronated, especially if it's a neutral grip. And the brachioradialis has the best leverage if your hand is completely pronated and peak forces are in the shortened position. If you want to grow your biceps as huge as possible, focusing on the lengthened or stretch position is definitely more optimal than vice versa. So choosing a creature curl variation, whether it's a dumbbell, easy bar or a machine is great for this option or a Bayesian curl. And now the inclined dumbbell curl is not a stretch bias movement. Vice versa, if you want to optimize your brachialis and brachioradialis growth, you want to choose an exercise where your hand again is pronated, as you know, but you want to choose an exercise that biases the shoulder position and has peak forces up there. One eternity later. Longer muscle length training causes more muscle damage compared to its counterpart and more muscle damage just means more recovery demands for your body and your muscles to recover from. And no, muscle damage is not a mechanism for hypertrophy. Your muscles don't get torn down with micro tears and get grown bigger. As a result, muscles grow from motor unit recruitment and mechanical tension. But why does frequency matter? Can't I just shit on my recovery and spam stretch bias movements to get the most optimal growth and get so huge like a fucking hog? No, bozo, you can't. A recent study has compared two types of training approaches. Group one did three sets three times per week, 
resulting in the low volume, high frequency approach. In group two, did the same amount of sets that the group one had across the week, which is nine sets, but they have done it in one single session. Which group do you think builds more muscle? The groups that did higher volumes and split their volume across the week got far more jacked the group two, who did a bunch of junk volume in one singular session. But why does frequency matter? Your body or your muscles are constantly rotating between a state of hypertrophy and atrophy. If you want to grow as much muscle as possible, you want to be in a huge net positive of hypertrophy compared to atrophy. With high frequencies, you're setting the stimulus more often instead of just training your muscle one time per week and leaving it at that, which means that you were spending less time in atrophy and more in hypertrophy, resulting in less muscle lost and more muscle gained. A few weeks ago, I thought that a set is just a set. Of course, I knew that leg extensions may not produce as much growth as a hex squat, but there's more to it. Not every single set is created equal. The first set of a given workout yields the most hypertrophy results out of them all. You need five more fucking sets to get the same stimulus of the first set, which just confirms why higher frequencies are far superior to lower frequencies. And this is why I'm against spamming stretch bias movements and not incorporating other strength profiles. As if muscle damage is increased and your recovery is hindered, you cannot train with higher frequencies and therefore not set the stimulus more often, spending more time in hypertrophy, and you cannot get that first set, which is the most hypertrophic set of a given workout. God damn. After all the tapping, what does training with higher frequencies even mean? For me, higher frequencies doesn't mean just training a muscle two times per week, which is still very good and better than one time per week. But training a muscle every two to three sleeps, resulting in a 2.5 or three times per week frequency is best. As if I'm coaching or writing my own program, I'm not looking at a single week, but how often can I train a muscle as much as possible? If I can be ready to train a muscle in three days again, fresh, get that first more stimulating set by not choosing two stretch bias movements, but one shoulder bias and one stretch bias movement, I will do that instead of just spamming stretch bias movements and increasing my recovery demands. So now, our goal is to minimize muscle damage while increasing our frequency by utilizing lengthened and shortened bias movements in our program. To have a complete program, not just spamming one singular fucking thing. Let's come back to the example before. We know that the biceps has the best leverage in the stretch position and the brachialis and the brachialis has the best leverage in the shortened position. So now, instead of following everyone's empty and unnuanced advice of just spamming two stretch bias movements in this situation, we can think more intellectually and choose one length of bias movement to give the biceps the best leverage and one shorter bias movement to give the brachioradialis and brachialis the best leverage. This way, we have improved our recovery, hit the muscles effectively, and now we can train with high frequency, getting the best possible results and getting so fucking jacked that the boys in your gym start staring at your muscles because you got so huge instead of that girl you would like to go out with.